This is Mrs. Alexander, and this is your 3.4 front load, talking about pedigrees and probabilities. Let's go over some pedigree symbols. First of all, pedigree is a family tree. Uh, geneticists use pedigrees to determine how a trait is passed on and what the probability is that you will give a future offspring or future child the disease or the trait that you're tracking. For pedigrees, we use squares for males and circles for females, and then we use shading in order to show something being passed on. We will shade the entire square or circle in if the person is affected. Different diseases have different ways that they're passed on. So this shading can be one recessive, it can be one dominant trait, or it could be two recessive traits. It just depends on the, the inheritance. We'll talk more about that in a few slides. When the box is halfway shaded in, it doesn't matter if it's shaded on the right or the left. Shading just means that the person is a carrier or they have one gene or one trait or one allele for that inherited trait. Whenever you connect a circle to a square or a square to a circle with a line directly connecting them, that means that they have had some sort of relationship that allowed them to have offspring. It says that they're married, but a lot of the times it doesn't mean that there's marriage. It can just simply mean that they've had um, fertilization has occurred and they've had offspring. Offspring or children are represented by a line coming down from that branch. And then notice that the children in the bottom siblings, circle, square, circle, they are not connected directly with the line. That does not show, that shows that they have not been sexually active with one another. It simply shows that they are siblings. So by connecting a circle and square with a line, it shows some sort of sexual encounter has happened in order to have offspring. So again, shading a square or a circle in is considered affected. When we talk about sex link traits, they put a dot in the middle. Um, carriers, they're shaded half. And then deceased, you just basically cross out the box to show that they're no longer alive. When you organize this pedigree or this family tree, um, you use Roman numeral, numerals on the left to represent generations, like grandparents, parents, and then your generation. That's like one, two, three, and then your future children could be four. Um, usually we refer to it as an individual based off of like the first or the second going from left to right. So the first generation has a square and a circle. That would be generation one, offspring or individual number one and number two. If you kind of look up here, the first dark black circle, the first affected individual is in the second generation, and they're the third one over. So that's why we call it Roman numeral two with a three afterwards. The next two are in generation four, but they are individuals two and three. Again, recessive pedigrees will be used in this class to show how genetic diseases can be hidden throughout your family, but then show up. Things like red hair, blue eyes, which aren't diseases, but they are recessive traits, and then the disease that we learned about called sickle cell anemia. Recessive diseases and recessive traits, you must inherit a small letter or a recessive trait or allele from each parent. We show this on pedigrees as a fully shaded in circle, in this case for female, or a fully shaded in square for male. That means they have two of the same allele. They're homozygous for the recessive trait. Individuals who do not carry the trait at all are completely left blank, like the far left. This female has two dominant traits um, that do not show sickle cell. The one in the middle shows a carrier. A carrier is someone who is half shaded in. Again, it doesn't matter what side you shade, the left or the right. It just shows that they carry whatever trait you were talking about. Each pedigree should have a key with it or a title that tells you what you're tracking, a recessive trait, a dominant trait, a sex link trait, or in the name of it, red hair, blue eyes, sickle cell anemia, hemophilia, best disease, whatever one we're talking about. In this case, we're going to cover recessive pedigrees first. Let's see if you can practice some of the things we've talked about when it comes to knowing what generation and individuals are affected, what carriers look like, what recessive traits look like, so forth. So I have two questions I'd like you guys to analyze. You can do this in your laboratory notebooks, on some paper, just in your head, wherever you'd like, and you can pause the video after the question to see if you're correct. First question is, look at this recessive pedigree. Which individual or individuals are carriers? Are there any individuals with the actual sickle cell trait? Pause the video now to complete this activity. Recessive pedigrees answers. So, if you guys take a look, we have two carriers on this chart, the top two. Or in this case, we can think of it as grandma and grandpa, or grandpa and grandma. Individual 1 and individual 2 in generation 1 are carriers because they're halfway shaded in. 
The only individual in this chart, on this pedigree, is individual one of generation two, who's fully shaded in. It's a male, because it's square. In order for individual one of generation two to get the trait, he would have had to receive the unhealthy or shaded in side from dad and the unhealthy shaded in side from mom. So he inherited the recessive trait from both parents. Let's think about this as sickle cell. You could also think of this as like red hair. This is like having a mom and a dad who both have any other hair color besides red, but someone in their family had to have had red hair somewhere in, or, in order for them to be heterozygous or a carrier. And so they just happened to get that child did, the square male, the individual one, happened to get the red hair trait from dad and mom. Thus, they'd show the recessive trait. This is why recessive traits can be hidden in family members and show up in later generations. Go back to sickle cell. Um, so if you look, we have a generation two individual one who's a boy, a male, and then he's got a sister and a brother that he's all blood related to. The sister and the brother, notice they are completely unshaded, meaning that they got the healthy or unshaded box from dad and the unshaded circle half from mom. That means that they are homozygous dominant. They do not have any traits at all. They're not carriers. There's no way they can pass it on to their children. So we've just answered, how is it able to run in families but not show up in every generation? The answer is because it's recessive. So please be able to identify pedigrees, like the picture below, and be able to tell me if it's a recessive or if it's a dominant pedigree. In this case, recessive pedigrees show carriers. Let's talk about dominant pedigrees. Dominant pedigrees are a little different than recessive because you only need one capital letter or one dominant trait to show the the gene. So in this case, individual two of generation one, we don't know if they're homozygous dominant or if they're heterozygous dominant. We don't know if they have two big B's or one big B and one little b. In this case, if you look at the key above the pedigree, I'm talking about the letter B representing best disease. In class, we learned that best degree disease is a dominant disease in which causes the eye to deteriorate, it's macular degeneration, can cause blindness before the age of 15. Um, this disease, if one of your parents has it, there's a really good chance that you'll inherit the trait. Okay, so let's look at the mom in generation one. She is individual two. She's the circle that's darkened and blacked. She mated with a husband who was not a carrier nor was he had best disease because in this case carriers have the disease that means that dad had to have given half of his dna to his daughter individual one in generation two his son individual two generation two and his other son individual three generation two because we know half your dna comes from your dad half comes from your mom we know that individual one and three in the second generation all must be heterozygous. They have to have a healthy gene from dad. So we know that they're heterozygous. However, we don't have any information on individual four in generation two because notice individual four in generation two is not blood related to one or two. She is simply the wife of the male, the third gener second generation individual three. They made it and then they had two children. Note that one of their children, individual two in generation three, does not have best disease. That tells me that his parents, who are both darkened, they must be heterozygous. They must have a healthy trait in there as well. Because how else would you have a child without any best disease if both parents have the disease themselves? Both parents must have had a recessive trait for best disease, which is healthy in this case. So let's practice this. I switched up the letters a little bit, and I want to see if you can determine or look at this dominant pedigree and answer these questions. Pause the video and answer them on your own in your laboratory notebook in your head, and we'll talk about it in class. First question, which individual are heterozygous? That means capital B, lowercase b. Which individuals are homozygous, recessive? That means two lowercase b's are, in this case, unaffected. Pause the video. All right, let's test our skills about dominant pedigrees. Take a look at this practice number two. Using paper or your own brain, see if you can figure out which individuals are heterozygous, a big letter and little letter, and which individuals are homozygous recessive, two little letters, or in this case, not affected. Pause the video here and try to figure this out for the answers. All right, we're going to work this problem out. We know for sure that any of the individuals who are not shaded have to be recessive in this case, since it's a dominant pedigree. That means all the squares that are unshaded are little b, little b, homozygous recessive. However, in dominant pedigrees, notice there are no carriers. There, are still the, there is still the genotype 
heterozygous. So if you said, well, there's no, there's no heterozygous individuals, then you were wrong, but you were close to the answer because in a dominant pedigree, you shade the entire thing in regardless if it's a carrier or affected, uh, homozygous dominant, because both show affected. So let's start with individual two in generation one. Let's call her grandma. Grandma could be homozygous dominant or hetero. In order to figure out what grandma is, we don't have her parents to go off of. So we have to go off of what her offspring show. Notice her son, individual two in generation two, is not affected. This means that the son had to have gotten half of his DNA from mom and half from dad. Since dad can only contribute one of his lowercase letter b's, that means mom, or in this case grandma, individual two generation one, has to be a heterozygous based off of having a kid without the trait. All right, so now that we've established grandma is hetero, that would make sense that the individuals one and three in generation two, the shaded in circle and square, would both have to have half from mom, half from dad. Because mom is the only one, or grandma in this case, is the only one that has a uh, capital B, we know that individual one will also be heterozygous because they got half of their DNA from dad and half from mom. So let's go on and look at individual three. He is a carrier, but in this case affected with best disease, has married someone, a female, who is also has the disease, best disease. We can determine that the mom, or individual four in generation two, would have to be a carrier uh, or heterozygous for best disease, not fully homozygous dominant, because she had a son without it. Because individual two, the unshaded square, would have had to receive half of his DNA from mom and half from dad. Therefore, we know that both parents in generation two were heterozygous. The only individual we cannot determine what their genotype is just by looking at their physical disease, their phenotype, is individual one in generation three. She could have gotten both capital B's from mom and dad. She could have gotten a big B from mom, little b from dad, or vice versa. So as we answered the question, the only individual we were not able to determine would be the child, the female child that's shaded in. This leads us to how we can go from a pedigree to something like a Punnett square to figure out probabilities. In this case, pedigrees and probabilities work together because you're able to look at what your percentage chances of having an offspring with a genetic disease. A Punnett square is just a little uh, diagram you can use and you can put your genetic information, your genotype in at the top and you can put somebody that you might have future offspring with on the left or vice versa, left, right, right, left. And then you drag and drop your genes or your alleles into the boxes to figure it out. In this case, we're going to start with a pea plant example. So let's think of tall being dominant. I'm using capital T for tall. And then small is going to be recessive. So capital T, tall traits are going to hide short traits. Just like blonde hair, black hair, brown hair hides the red hair trait. In this case, in pea plants, tall hides the short trait. The only way a pea plant comes out short or dwarf is if it has two lowercase t's. You might be wondering, why did I not use the letter s for short? Well, in genetics, you just pick one letter to represent it, and if there's different alleles or different versions, like tall and short, you stick with the dominant trait or the disease name. So in this case, tall, a lowercase t, is representing short. For Punnett squares, you first take the parent's DNA and you put it on the top and the left. Um, for grading purposes, it's nice if you go ahead and put the first parent mentioned in the prompt or in the question at the top and the second parent on the left. So there we go, we put two big T's at the top and two little T's on the left. And then what you do is you drag them over and you drop them from the top. It doesn't matter which one you do first, second or last, as long as when you drag and drop them over, I like to put my finger at the top and on the left and drag and drop them over like a multiplication table. As long as you do it correctly and the big T and a little T, if there's one of each in each box, then make sure the big one's in front of the little one because it dominates over it. This isn't always the case. Sometimes you mix heterozygous individuals as well. Um, the offspring go in the middle of the box, the Punnett square, so we call that those offspring the first generation. And then when you think of outcomes, I want you to think of them in terms of 25% or in terms of percentages. If one box is filled in, that's like a 25% chance. If two of the boxes match, for example, here we've crossed two heterozygous, you have two out of the four boxes, there's a 50% chance. There's also the example of 100 or 0%.